<coughs> all right, welcome. Let's get started. Uh, first of all, if you didn't attend class on Tuesday or, or otherwise didn't pick up your exam, you can get that from me at the end of class. Um, your next homework assignment is due on Tuesday, and we'll go over some key ideas from one of those problems at the end of class today, and the example we're working will addre uh, directly address another one of them. But for problem 14, that's kind of a, uh, a very short answer type problem, and I'd like to ask you to explain your reason. So I think that's one where you're classifying the flow. So explain why you picked the thing that you did. Just kind of uh, provide some sort of a justification to help the grader understand that you actually knew the material. So that's due on Tuesday. Uh, today we're going to be talking about fluid acceleration, and then we'll just sort of very briefly touch on the uh, first ideas associated with Euler's equation. Any questions before we get into the new material? All right. So remember that here in chapter four, finally we're going to be talking about fluids when they start to move. So our grand objective is try to try and predict what is the pressure change of a fluid as it's flowing, whereas previously we were limited to the hydrostatic equation that said the only acceleration that's acting on the fluid is gravitational. So when water is actually moving, then there are uh, different types of accelerations that we have to be aware of. So um, the acceleration of a particle as it moves through space over time uh, is going to depend on changes in velocity with respect to time and position. And these are two different types of acceleration. So let's look at some brief videos that illustrate both of those types of acceleration. So here is going to be acceleration with respect to time. So what happened was it was initially at rest, some rockets fired, and its velocity increased very quickly. Um, so let's look at this other video. This is going to be acceleration with res respect to position rather than change in velocity over time. I'm going to check my period data station. Ready? It's ready, operator? Ready. It's ready and medical. Ready. It is ready. Final ready? And three, two, one, engage. Legs tight, deep breath. Hold it. Your top reach. One, two, reach. One, two, reach. Doing good. As the centrifuge spins, the pilot's body is trying to go straight, but the direction is constantly changing. This pushes the body outward. They call it a G-force or gravity force, but it's actually a measure of acceleration. Acceleration is the change in velocity over the change in time. Velocity is determined by both speed and direction. So even if the speed stays the same, because the direction is constantly changing, there is acceleration. This outward force is called centrifugal force. All right. So as the, uh, I guess that's a pilot, as he changes position, then the uh, direction component of the velocity is constantly changing. And so the tangential acceleration is the change in speed, and that's time dependent, whereas the centripetal acceleration is related to position. And uh, so we have to be aware of both. And flow can change either where one of them is active or both of them is active. Of course, if you have neither, um, neither type of acceleration, then you'd have steady and you'd have um, uh, steady flow. And so the uh, local acceleration is when, what's causing the unsteady flow. And that can be the direction or the magnitude is changing with respect to time. And so what we have to do is take the derivative of the velocity with respect to time, and then we can know the local acceleration. And so the rocket sled that we saw or you know, vehicle that's accelerating over the course of time then uh, that's our definition of local acceleration. 
Now, convective acceleration is a little bit uh, more tricky because we're used to thinking about change in velocity over time. This is maybe the definition of acceleration that you were most acquainted with, assuming, you know, like you took uh, physics in high school. We do lots of problems related to change in velocity over time. But convective acceleration is something that is uh, less commonly taught, and that is where um, over time, conditions can be constant. And so let's say in a contracting nozzle like this, uh, we have 10 meter per second velocity as the flow is entering the nozzle. But then because the cross-sectional diameter is decreasing, and now here at the outlet, the cross-sectional area is half of what the cross-sectional area was at the entry, now that means that the velocity is double. And so there was an acceleration there. We know that the in the direction of flow, the velocity increased. But if we took a picture of this and we came back an hour later, even if the velocities were the same over time, there's still an acceleration in the direction of position. So that's convective acceleration. And that's what's associated with non-uniform flow. And so it's kind of a chicken and the egg thing, whether you think about the local acceleration as causing unsteady flow or if it's unsteady flow because it's local acceleration. But the key thing is, is that they're related, and we can classify the flow conditions according to what kind of acceleration we have. So here's the table that we started to look at in class during the last period. And what we said was the way that we classify whether flow is uniform or non-uniform is whether the velocity is changing with respect to position. And so now in the second bullet point here of the comparison, we say that non-uniform flow exists when there's convective acceleration. And then to contrast that to the distinguishing between steady and unsteady flow, it's the local acceleration that causes unsteady flow. And that's where we have a change in velocity with respect to time. OK, so here's convective acceleration. It's that same nozzle that we saw before. And uh, this is an illustration that's provided by the text. And they give an equation that relates the, uh, the velocity as a function of position within that nozzle. And so we can find the velocity u at any point in the flow field as a function of the initial velocity u0. So the initial velocity as the flow enters this nozzle is 10 meters per second. But then as x increases, then so does the velocity. And what this formula does is it tells us at any location x what the velocity is going to be. So for instance, when we have x is all the way over here to L, meaning that we're at the outlet of the nozzle, substitute that into the formula. When x is equal to L, then it's going to be u0 divided by 0.5. So that's essentially double the initial velocity. So if our initial velocity was 10, then the outlet velocity would be 20. But it's not just limited to the entry and the outlet. We can plug that into any location. And in fact, the definition of convective acceleration is that you need to know at a single point not only what is the velocity there, but how the velocity is changing with respect to position. So uh, u times du dx. So the convective acceleration varies from point to point within the flow field. At the beginning, where you'll notice that that nozzle seems like the, uh, the edges are relatively parallel to each other, there isn't much acceleration to begin with. And the same is true at the outlet. You know, the nozzle is more or less already contracted, and so there's not much more change. But it's where those walls are pointed together at the steepest angle, where you're having the most acceleration, <coughs> is going to be where the diameter is contracting most quickly. And so in this illustration, it's asking us to find the convective acceleration at a position x equals 0.25 meters in the middle, because the overall nozzle length L here in this example is 0.5 meters. So what we want to do is we want to first find the velocity in the middle at that location. So find u at the position of interest, and then find out du dx <coughs> at that location. All right, so I'm going to work this one on the board, actually. I know that usually uh, my procedure is to turn you loose on problems like these and have you collaborate with your classmates. Um, but I'm going to do this one on the whiteboard. 
First of all, let's start with the uh, given information. Our given is that the length of it is 0 0.50 meters. <clears throat> the initial velocity, u naught, is 10 meters per second. And then uh, we have some position of interest, 0.25 meters. And I'd encourage you to take notes on this. You've got a homework problem that's pretty closely related to this problem. Um, and we have the uh, velocity changing as a function of position. Velocity as a function of position. Okay, so our formula for that is that the velocity is the initial velocity divided by 1 minus 0 0.5 x divided by L. Now the definition of convective acceleration is the velocity at a certain point multiplied by du dx. So we have to take the derivative of our velocity function with respect to uh, dx. And to do that we're going to use the chain rule. So given some velocity, then what is du dx? Okay. Now, if it's been a while since you used the chain rule, I'll refresh your memory, because it's certainly been a while since I used it. You know, in civil engineering, we don't use calculus as much as, say, electrical engineering. And, uh, so there's just occasional opportunities to use it. du dx is du dm multiplied by dm dx. And so what we need to do is identify some intermediate variable. And what we're going to say is let m, this intermediate variable, we're going to assign to be 1 minus 0.5x divided by l. So the denominator of our velocity function, we're going to call that m. And then we're going to take the derivative of m with respect to x in the chain rule. Okay. So now over here on the other whiteboard, I'm going to say, so the velocity is u0 divided by m. Okay, because we are originally given, this is our velocity function, we're just saying, let's substitute m for the entirety of the denominator. So then, uh, another way to write that would be u0 to the m to the minus 1 power, since it's down in the denominator. So, uh, thus, what we can do is say that du dx becomes the derivative of u naught m minus 1 power with respect to dm. And then the derivative of, we're going to now substitute in the meaning of m here, which is 1 minus 0.5x divided by L dx. So let me give you a moment to write that down and absorb it. Okay, so uh, what that becomes is minus 1 times u naught to the m to the minus 2 power. So we've taken the derivative of this interior expression with respect to m. So it was to the minus 1 power. That minus 1 goes down in front of it. Now it's to the minus 2 power. And then uh, let's still leave this as... Okay, then this becomes 0.5 divided by L. So 
the 1 just drops out when we take it with respect to x, the derivative with respect to x. Uh, since this was x to the 1 power, now it's x to the 0 power, so that term just becomes negative 0.05, uh, 0.5 divided by L. Okay, and then we reestablish that our M is equal to 1 minus 0.5x divided by L. So then we can substitute that back in. Therefore, du dx is minus 1 u naught divided by 1 minus 0.5x divided by L squared. So this was m to the minus 2 power. So we're saying put it in the denominator and then substitute back in what we said m is equal to. And then it's still multiplied by negative 0.5 divided by L. So if we combine those two terms together, then it's 0.5 times u naught divided by L times 1 minus 0.5x divided by L squared. All right, so we have our du dx. Now, what we have to do then is we say that we have x is equal to 0.25 meters and L is equal to 0.5 meters. So u du dx is 0.5 u squared, u naught squared divided by, and then the L value, we're going to substitute in 0 0.5 meters, 1 minus 0 0.5 times 0 0.25 meters, divided by 0 0.5 meters, and that is cubed. Hmm, yeah, I'm just wondering the same thing myself. Let's see here. It's because we are multiplying it by u, right? Because uh, our definition of u is this. So here is u, and this whole thing is u times du dx. So this all was just the du dx, and we're multiplying it by u. So it's to the cubed power. Okay, so in other words, if we simplify that, then it's uh, u naught squared divided by 0 0.75 cubed. So that's 2.370 u naught squared. All right, so if we have our initial velocity, which was 10 meters per second, since I'm running low on board space over there, I'm going to switch back to this other board here. So uh, substituting in the velocity initial is 10 meters per second, then u du dx is 2.370 times 10 squared. So it's 237 meters per second squared. And that's the convective acceleration at a certain point. So what we're saying is that in the uh, convective acceleration, 
we have to know at a certain location both the velocity and how the velocity is changing with respect to position. So u times du dx. And in this equation, we couldn't directly take the derivative with respect to x, and so we had to do it in steps using the chain rule. And at the end of that, once we had our answer for what is du dx, so here's du dx, then we need to know at a certain location what are we multiplying the velocity at that location in the middle by du dx at that point. So the, uh, the units of acceleration end up being the same. It's still meters per second squared, which is sometimes a little bit, um, I don't know, unfamiliar when we're saying that the position, uh, that the velocity is changing with respect to position, but since it's acceleration, it still has the same units that we're accustomed to. All right. So uh, as we've been recording, I've had the solution up on the screen there. If you uh, weren't able to copy something down or you want to go through it another time, then it is available on the recording if you want to review that before the homework assignment. All right, so just a review. Steady flow is when the velocity is constant with respect to time. Uniform flow is when velocity is constant with respect to position. And here are our definitions of local acceleration and convective acceleration. So local is change in velocity with respect to time. Convective is change with respect to position, but we have to multiply the change with respect to position at a certain location by the velocity at that location in order to find the acceleration. So it's the cause of non-uniform flow. Now, where we're headed is that uh, towards the end of class today and then on Tuesday, we'll talk about Euler's equation. And Euler's equation tells us how to predict changes in pressure when you have local acceleration. So in other words, if you have a container of water that is in some sort of a uh, rocket sled, let's say, for example, then the pressure at the back side of that container of water is going to be different than in the front part of the water. You know, at ordinarily, what we've been saying until now is that um, pressure only changes as we go down through a fluid. And so side to side, the pressure doesn't change at all. But if the, the fluid vessel is accelerating sideways, then that ends up not being true. If it's accelerating to the side and is experiencing gravitational forces, then there's going to be a change in pressure as you go down through the fluid and then also horizontally, meaning in the direction of acceleration. So that will be Euler's equation. And then later on, Bernoulli's equation is going to allow us to predict what happens when we have non-uniform flow. And so it will be uh, predicting changes in pressure when you've got fluids that are flowing with convective acceleration. All right. So here's another way of putting together a 4x4 four four matrix that says sometimes we can have steady and uniform flow. So imagine water that's going through a pipe, and the pipe walls are parallel, so that means that the velocity isn't changing as you go in the direction of flow. So here there's no change in flow velocity with respect to position. So these arrows are both the same length, just indicating that the velocity of the water that enters this pipe segment is the same as the velocity of the water that exits the pipe, sub pipe segment. Now, constant over time just means that if there's a valve upstream or downstream, it's not that someone's closing or opening that valve. So over time, things are the same. But if we had unsteady flow, the picture would look the same. You know, between steady and unsteady, the flow image at a single instant is the same, but you could have changing over time um, if someone was opening or closing the valve gradually, meaning that the velocity is going to be adjusted. And we saw the video of those hikers with open channel flow velocity that was changing over time last time. So you've seen what steady, uns what unsteady flow looks like. Now in the case of non-uniform flow, you can have non-uniform flow that's steady 
So that means the steady compo component of it means is that nothing's changing over time. It's constant over time, but since it's non-uniform, the flow velocity is changing with respect to position. And so here you'll notice the arrow is larger at the outlet of this contracting section because the same volume of flow that enters this nozzle has to exit the nozzle. But since there's a smaller cross-sectional area, it has to exit at a larger velocity. And the same is true with this nozzle if you've got a change in flow velocity over time. So you can have non-uniform flow that's also unsteady. So not only is it changing with respect to position, but then it's also changing over time. And so that means that maybe we have a slow flow rate now, and later the flow rate will be higher. And so that means that the outlet is going to have an even greater increase in velocity in the future than it does now because of it, con it, it being a contracting section there. So the reason I present this to you is just to let you know that it's not that you can only have uniform or steady flow. That Actually, you can have, there are four flow conditions here that it can be any one of those four. Okay, so Euler's equation. Um, it's used to model pressure change when you have local acceleration. And we'll start by talking about how it models pressure change, but it also can model uh, changes in position of a fluid. Because the response of a fluid, if it's accelerating in a closed tank, is different than if it's accelerating in an open tank. We talked about a uh, container of water in some sort of, uh, like a ro that rocket sled that we saw the video of before. And so think about if we had that container of water and it's accelerating horizontally and it's the water tank is full and uh, it's full all the way to the top and it's enclosed. So between location one and location two if it's accelerating to the left, then that means that the pressure is increasing in the opposite direction of acceleration. So if it's accelerating to the left, then that means the pressure at 2 is going to be greater than the pressure at 1. And for most people, that's a, a kind of an instinctive thing. And you can think of it just as what happens to an astronaut as they're blasting off. You know, the pressure is greatest along the back, that they're leaning against the seat and the pressure is increasing, they're experiencing those g-forces as their velocity increases over time. Uh, if we have an open container, however, like a tank of water that is open to the atmosphere, then before it's accelerating, the liquid level would be horizontal, but then when it begins to accelerate, what happens is that the liquid surface changes. And so it's going to be tilting like this, so that there's less liquid on the left, more liquid on the right. And what we'll look at is how we can find out the angle that that makes with the uh, horizontal. That'll be one of the things that we talk about in class on Tuesday. The Euler's equation will allow us to do both of those things. It'll allow us to relate what happens to a fluid when it's experiencing local acceleration. So in the past, when we were using the hydrostatic equation, it was just saying, we've got some fluid that isn't moving anywhere. And the way that we measure the change in pressure is by looking at delta H. And uh, the hydrostatic equation was that delta P is delta H times gamma. Euler's equation is an extension, and it includes the hydrostatic equation. And one of the common mistakes that students make in exams is that they'll solve the Euler's equation and then they'll look at the pressure change that's predicted by Euler's and then they'll add the hydrostatic pressure change on top of it. And it's kind of like they're double accounting for the gravitational effect because Euler's equation already accounts for the gravitational effect. Um, Euler's equation says, well, for instance, if we have this tank that's on the screen here, what if it was accelerating upward at 9.81 meters per second squared, which is equal to g, and if we had a delta h of 1 meter? So it would be easy to find the pressure at a depth of 1 meter if we had the hydrostatic equation applying, 
was just the hydrostatic equation then delta P is delta H times gamma and what we'd say one meter and the gamma 9810 newtons per meter cubed. So the pressure at a depth of one meter is 9810 newtons per meter squared. What this is saying is, imagine that it, the whole tank is accelerating upward at 9.81 meters per second squared. So then, where Euler's equation begins is by saying, we've got an acceleration other than gravitational. So instead of just saying delta H times gamma, let's say delta H times the density of the fluid times whatever the G is. And normally we say gamma is density of the fluid times G. But one way to think about Euler's equation is just to say the sum of all the vertical accelerations that is being experienced by the fluid that's accelerating. Now, this isn't yet the full version of Euler's equation. We'll get into that full version of Euler's equation a bit later. Um, but I'd like you to calculate, in this case, what would be the change in pressure if it's accelerating upward at 9.81 meters per second squared. A warning, you only use this approach when you've got vertical acceleration. If you have a sideways acceleration, then this wouldn't be the route to go. We'll get into the more detailed analysis on Tuesday. But for now, I'm going to pause the recording, give you a moment to calculate the change in pressure if you had it accelerating upward at 9.81. So if it's accelerating upwards, that's effectively going to be doubling the gravitational effect that's acting. And so uh, the pressure, instead of being 9810 newtons per meter squared, is going to be 19,620. And likewise, if this fluid was accelerating downward, then that would mean that the, the gravitational effect is being canceled out and that there wouldn't be any pressure change as you go through the fluid. Um, you know, if you were accelerating the fluid downward at 9.81 meters per second squared. Okay, so the origin of Euler's equation that we're going to look at is taking a, a packet of water and saying that we want to look at the sum of the forces that are acting on that element of water and relating them to the local acceleration. So here is a, a figure that shows some element of water in space. And in this case, they're, they've just picked a, a cylindrical shape for that element of water. And um, we've got it accelerating in a certain direction, in the L direction. And you'll notice here from this axis, it's showing that there is an X, Y, and Z coordinate system. And L is just some direction. It's not necessarily in any one of those x, y, or z exclusively. And so Euler's equation can apply to acceleration in any direction. And what we want to do is keep track of the volume of water inside of this element. And if we know the volume of water, then there's going to be some weight of the fluid that's acting downward. There's going to be pressure on the fluid just because it's immersed in a liquid uh, surrounding, you know, this element of water is surrounded by other liquid. and so. There's going to be a pressure that's because of the hydrostatic forces that are acting on it. But there's going to be a pressure acting over a cross-sectional area. And so the forces of the, uh, the liquid on the outside of the control volume, the pressure that's acting on that circular cross-sectional area is acting as though it's a, uh, an external force. And so here where it's saying uh, P times delta A, and then on the top of it, P plus delta P, that's saying that on the front face of this element of water, the pressure is going to be different, maybe lower, maybe higher, but you're going to have a different pressure, and the direction of that force is going to be acting against that fluid element because it's a force from outside the control volume. Uh, it's just the pressure of the fluid that surrounds this element of liquid. And so, Euler's equation is this fluid the fluid element that is experiencing local acceleration. And the questions that we will have to look at is the mass of the fluid element, because that affects um, the weight of it. It also is going to be related to 
depending on the volume, the unit weight of the fluid. Um, Euler's equation takes into account differences in forces relative to the cross-sectional area, and those differences in forces is what actually causes it to accelerate. You know, that's why we have an acceleration, is because an imbalance of external forces. And then the directionality of the change in pressure is going to help us to understand the acceleration, and based on the coordinate system, Remember that the pressure increases in the opposite direction of the acceleration. So if this fluid is accelerating in the L direction, then that means that the pressure would be higher in the back face than it is in the front face. Okay, so let me give you, uh, before we talk about this, let me give you a preview of where we're headed with Euler's equation. Now this is a slide that we'll talk about in more detail on Tuesday of next week. But the Euler's equation, since it works in any L direction, what we do is we apply it in, um, in either X direction or in the vertical direction. Let's say that we're working in, um, in X being horizontal and Z being vertical. We break up problems into however many directions the fluid is being accelerated, and we apply Euler's equation and it keeps track of the pressure change both because of the gravitational effects and also because of the external uh, local acceleration that's being applied. So sort of where we're headed with Euler's equation is to go beyond just the idea that maybe we're doubling acceleration vertically. And this, this homework assignment that you have, problem 39, is saying we've got some cylinder of water that is being pressed upward with the piston and um, we want to find out the acceleration that's the cause of some pressure at the bottom side of that piston. So this is just working in one direction and it's vertical, which is the same direction as gravity. But Euler's equation that we'll start learning the, the full version of it in class on Tuesday allows you to work in any direction beyond just the vertical acceleration. So specifically on the, the key ideas for this problem, uh, this is a little bit unusual in that it's one of the few problems you've got during the semester that's in the traditional units. And so here they're giving you the pressure at the bottom of that uh, cylinder of water. And as a note, here are some conversion factors that if we're talking about one pound per square inch, then that translates into 144 pounds per square foot. And then, of course, G, most people already know that. But then it's been a while since we talked about the density of water in terms of traditional units. And it's uh, 1.94 slugs per cubic foot. Um, rather than using uh, the density of you know, 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, here when we're working in uh, traditional units, you have to use slugs. So here, uh, you can use the same approach that we did on that earlier example here. We know that this is accelerating upward, uh, and we want to find out what is the cause of this additional pressure. So what you can do is find out what would the pressure be if it was just static conditions, like if there was no acceleration, what would be the pressure at a depth of 10 feet? And then look at the pressure that it's actually predicting. And if it's more pressure than you'd see under static conditions, that means it's accelerating up. If it's less pressure, then that means it's accelerating down. And then this given diameter of one foot, that's just another instance of some information that isn't going to affect the pressure one way or the other. OK, so that's all we're going to talk about today is just a brief introduction to uh, fluid acceleration. We'll get into more of the details on Euler's equation in class on Tuesday. Just as a reminder, uh, not only do you have the homework assignment that's due on Tuesday, but for the lab that we had this week for the uh, um, metacentric height, uh, I've already got some questions about the angle. And so the angle, when you're just working on your calculator, you can switch your angle on your calculator between degrees mode or radians mode. And so the measurement that you took in the lab, those were degrees. And so you can leave your calculator in degrees mode and then just you know, put the measured degree angle into the cotangent function and you'll be able to find the metacentric height. 
But in the case of the uh, Excel, you need to convert it over to radians before you put the angle into uh, any one of the trigonometric functions. So if you have any questions on the lab, let me know. Otherwise, uh, that's it for today, and I'll see you on Tuesday.